I'm going to take you into the way that I would begin a figurative piece. Uh, I generally start uh, with, wow, it's unmuted again. <laughs> All right, I'm going to find, find the person who's unmuted and try to mute them. Okay. Um, Okay, so thank you all for coming this evening. I'm happy that you're here in my studio here in Germantown. Um, and this is where the, I do the bulk of my work. I'm primarily figurative, uh, but I do do landscape. And uh, I would probably like to say that a lot of my forays into the landscape have helped me with uh, my figurative work. Although I don't showcase those too much uh, because the figure is pretty paramount in what I do. So I'm going to kind of run you through how I would begin a, uh, a figurative piece uh, and it's not linear. It's very, very, um, it's a very non-linear approach. Um, and a lot of what I do um, actually doesn't physically get done, I have to work with a model for quite some time um, in order for me to suss out a, an idea. And even when I get an idea for a painting, uh, it has to go through many phases. Um, where um, I don't go in with a plan and I don't go in with a uh, preliminary drawing. I just go in and make a big mess and then get myself out of it. Uh, but I do have a very general idea of what I do. But what I, I really like to start doing is I like to have a perspectival box. I'm going to do a little charcoal first um, before I begin an oil. I have my oil set up and ready to go. Um, and I do have an image of a model that I'm working with uh, off screen. And prior to this webinar, I have been kind of working with this model. It's actually going to be coming into my studio tomorrow. Um, but I like to start with a perspectival box. And then I think of general shapes that I feel like I'm going to put in uh, my piece here. Um, so I work very, very, like with this painting, I'm gonna, it's gonna be a very quick one that I'm gonna do for you all today. Uh, it's gonna be a very, very abbreviated way that I work. Because generally it would take me maybe three or four days, maybe a week to do a piece. Um, so I kind of like the plan here of this form and using a perspectival box and putting a form in this box it helps me think of negative and positive shape. So it's already a very abstracted cubist piece. Um, and I kind of like that plan uh, pretty much. It's going to be very, yeah, someone's mic is still on. We oh, I don't hear them. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's, it's not outside here in my studio, but I hear some talking. But it's, it's okay, it's okay. So um, here's a piece that I did that I was actually thinking of doing an oil from based on a perspectival box. Uh, so whenever I do a painting, I kind of imagine a box. This is gonna act as my canvas or my panel that I'm working on. Um, and in this, um, I have a figure there, but I'm actually thinking more of big shapes that are gonna break this uh, perspective or this kind of compositional box going on. Um, and that works out a lot for me. I'm thinking of how this figure is reacting to the four sides of my panel. Okay. One of the things we were taught in school was to, when you have a piece that you have four sides, and how the subject that you're doing is going to react to the four sides of your uh, canvas or panel or whatever. So my main 
uh, goal at this point is to create a piece, a very quick thumbnail of how that's going to work in a very abstracted form. So um, the figure is there as a point of, uh, of, of, of departure for me to create spaces uh, within uh, a piece. So what I would probably do now would be to begin to use color and pastel. I'm gonna be doing an oil piece here in a minute, but I wanna work out some things here. Okay, so I'm gonna keep my color key uh, very, very, um, very, 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 very simple. I'm not going to use a thousand colors. Okay, so what I'm doing is creating a design. All right, so I have my red and then my ground plane which is here. And that's basically what I have plus my charcoal. And I try to keep my color range very, very simple in the beginning. Now I may wanna kind of accentuate this form a little bit by putting in a little bit of flesh. And I'm going to use one additional pastel to work out this form. And that's basically it. And I may want to actually throw one more pen in there. And then I go back in with my charcoal and I reinforce my drawing a little bit. It stays very non-objective and abstract, but it's very basic. And what I want to do is create a design. Let me take a, you can have something like that that, move, that holds a lot of weight from a distance. And that's, generally my thumbnail in the beginning of um, of my piece. Now what I would next want to do, and I already have it planned here, I have an, a, another board that I keep that has my palette and my panel ready to go. And I put my sketch aside of a memory that I had with it. I like to have my palette, especially when I've been doing a lot of zooming recently with all this new teaching. I like to have my palette directly next to uh, my support that I have here, which is a wooden panel. I like to work with these birch panels here. A wooden birch panel, it's like an aircraft. You can, when you go to the art supply store, you can buy these what architectural students use to build architectural models. And they work really, really nicely for uh, sketches. And this has been sanded, uh, gessoed three times with acrylic gesso. And my ground is a lead ground that has been toned gray. And I have it clipped on my this wooden <clears throat> board. My palette is uh, set up next to my painting so I can make immediate adjustments. I can make immediate uh, um, kind of associations. I make a mixture and I can move very quickly. I find that if I have my palette, if I'm holding my palette and I have to look down, it's a bit of a distraction. Whereas if I make a move here, I can immediately see what's happening on my panel. And I do this, uh, I've actually started doing this recently because of teaching. It's very clear for my students to see how I make a move uh, and make a quick judgment. So um, I'm still working on the memory. And that's a big key thing with me. Let me move my iPad so it's more horizontal. Did I adjust something here? What I, I've, I find very, very important to tell people who study with me, who take my workshops or study with me privately, is the, uh, the whole importance of, of, of memory. Um, this is where abstracting the form for me really, really 
becomes what it is. I get the full fruit of of using the figure as a point of departure to create uh, non-figurative shapes by using my recollection. There's this wonderful saying, and I'll flash it on the screen here, by Degas, who was one of my heroes. Hopefully I can find it. Uh, here it is, if you can read this. Since it's all very well to copy what one sees, but it's far better to draw what one now only sees in one's memory. That is a transformation in which imagination collaborates with memory. And um, I'm more and more relying on my recollection of a moment that I've seen rather than being a slave to an image. Um, and that has been very key to me. And it's this saying right here has been one that has been, has pestered me my whole life. Uh, because the masters were able to create those flying angels and flying horses through their memory. And so I do have an image of the model here that I based that pastel on, but I'm going to move it out of my view and try to build from uh, my memory what I saw. And that's going to kind of go a long way. Can we... Can we take a peek at what you're working from, the model image? Oh, the, yeah, let me see if I can find. I'm sure that I made a picture of it. Yeah, here's the, the image that I'm working from. Okay. And it's easy for me to put this up and then draw from it and paint from it. Uh, but to me, that uh, it's, it's easy. And I want to get the, the, the more important, salient uh, things that I pulled from that. I find that uh, the, um, the drawing really brings out the, the main gesture of what's happening. I'm not being uh, distracted by the beautiful things like the hair and the arm, and I'm really going to the the guts of the of the of the piece, and that is the a lot of the negative and positive shapes it has much more power to it, I think, and I'm constantly trying to do that. Whenever I have models come into the studio, I'm I'm really persuading them to do very difficult poses. So, you know, that's my image that I'm kind of abstracting from. This one of Stephanie is one of the one of the models that I like to work with a lot. She's an amazing model here in Philadelphia. Um, and what I actually still have in my head is that pastel that I did for you all. And when you think of your figure in terms of geometric shapes, um, you know, you tend to kind of react a little bit more. You know, because I, bro I broke her down into these shapes, I can really begin to see like the composition happening a little bit faster. And the way that I like to start is I like to fill my panel up as fast as I can. Working small also helps. You have less area to fill when you're doing this. Now, I sometimes look at my photo reference, but the one thing that I don't do is like become like dependent on the image. I'm really thinking about, you know, and I actually work with bigger brushes than this. I don't know why I'm working with this small brush. And this is a very abbreviated little lesson I'll show you. Something like this would probably take me six or seven hours because the way that I like to work is very destructive. You know, I'm looking for a, um, a part of the painting that I really like. Uh, other tools that I like to use are Can we see a little bit more of your palette? 
Sure. Cool. That's what I was supposed to have done here. Oops, do that a little bit more. Yeah, that's great. It's tougher when I put it on a horizon because I have to raise the uh, that little knob in the way here. Where is it at? Oh, it's that little part. I just need to move my iPad a little bit that way for the knob. You guys can see a black knob. So, you know, that's kind of how I work. And I like to, well, again, here are my tools that aren't brushes. I like to use a palette knife, a brayer, and a rubber squeegee. These three things are uh, color manipulators. I actually even go in with my charcoal with uh, a draw, uh, an oil painting. I'll literally go in with my charcoal and begin to, to work that way. And I use my brayer to push the painting back a little bit. It creates different um, kind of shapes and whatnot. So I'm thinking of it's, when you're doing a painting, it takes time to kind of get used to your mediums and your paint and whatever. So I like to start out very, very abruptly. Like, I don't know why I'm thinking this, but I'm thinking of like a red, very big and bold. Push this form down a little bit. And I'm usually not talking when I'm painting. I'm working very, very fast without thinking. Um, but this is good practice to do this for you all, for me. You know, there was that whole light area here of that form. And it's very bold, I'm working very boldly. I'm not using very small brushes. I'm thinking in terms of big, bold shapes. And it, it already feels like a form. I take my rubber squeegee sometimes and I actually kind of push my color around and abrade it. I even sometimes take uh, a little bit of my odorless mineral spirits and kind of whack my painting like that and then push it down. And it creates all of these different textures. Okay, you start seeing a lot of different uh, things that are happening. A lot of why I do this, and some of you all who look at my work online will see evidences of my hand going in to destroy and push and pull and create things. Um, I think the big reason why I do a lot of those kind of things is I'm trying to get away from the reality of what I'm seeing and think more in terms of uh, lines and shapes. If I begin to become, again, dependent on that image and it being a figure, then I get lost in, I get, I get, I get tantalized by wanting to make it look like the form. And I'm constantly wanting to think of a non-form. I actually kind of like it so far. It's cool. And that I paint is I work the whole painting at once. So I'm also trying not to get too attached to a certain point or part of the painting. Um, so the photo reference kind of gets me there. You know, it gets me to, it gets me started. Um, and it takes me on a trip. It takes me and it makes me think about how I want to navigate this thing. Uh, my palette is simple. It's kind of messy for you all, but I have what's called a Zorn palette. And it's basically red, a cad red light, yellow ochre, ivory black, titanium white. Just those three colors plus white. So, you know, it's, it's that and this black, and then my titanium white, 
which has been dirty. I have a little bit of black in there. I added it, there's a different red here to add a little bit of variety, okay? But this is called a Zorn palette, and it's a very, very simple palette to use for doing flesh tones. Anders Zorn was a Swedish painter who was a contemporary of Sargent and Soroya, and he is known to have used this palette. Although some people think that he expanded his palette because there's some color ranges that this uh, very limited set can't get. So um, I like the simplicity of it because I can get to the matter at hand pretty quickly. So I, I tend to like to use my tools a lot and move my paint and get shapes. Uh, this is a wonderful tool. It's just a rubber squeegee. This one I've had since art school. It's about 15, 20 years old. You can see like where I've used staples to keep it from falling apart. It's like my favorite piece of favorite tool to use. Um, so the form is there. It's keeping me, but I'm going away from it as much as I can. And I'm moving it through. Just by doing this, I actually created a backbone. it up to the uh, tone of my panel. Um, I like working on a lead ground panel because you can scrape almost to the color. If you use an acrylic ground, you can't erase it almost to the white of the panel. Lead repels a lot of paint, so you can do that. So a lot of the process that I do is reductive, additive and reductive. So I'm constantly um, pushing. Now I haven't even looked at that photo reference of Stephanie. I'm still working from the memory of of A, the pastel I did, and B, just my memory of her. Um, working my background with a very solid color uh, really pushes my figure into, brings the weight against that figure. And it's something that I've kind of stolen from artists like Vermeer and Degas, who are a couple of my big influences. They used a very um, arbitrary color to create some of these forms. So um, I'm, in a way, abstracting this form. It's very, very non-dependent on <clears throat> my photo reference or my model. Um, so you can see this has a very strong, I feel, a very strong uh, approach and feel. Um, so something like that I would pretty much kind of keep working on. And then a, a lot of what I do is based on scraping and, just, and, and getting rid of. You know, I'm always letting my tools give me this opportunity to see things that um, may be opportunities for me to move away from. I actually kind of like uh, what's happening. Move this up a little. I really, really like what's happening in this area right here. And I, I really like this sense of movement happening there. Uh, and those are things that I think that if I had had my photo reference, I probably would not have, um, you know, seen. I would have been too dependent on making it look like her back. Uh, that's right there how I would do a quick oil. I have, um, I'm, 
um, more into doing like the pastel. And I'll move back to the pastel here. Quick question, Martin. Thank what co what kind of sure uh, black black oil paint was that? Was that ivory black? It was it was ivory because it's yeah. a cool black. Okay. Um, so um, this still has that freshness to it that I think that oil could approach, and it has a very poster like effect. It is very, very um, strong. I can find, I can feel that after I do this little webinar, short little demo that I just did there, that once I leave you all, I'll continue to work on it. And I'll, if you all find me on Instagram, I'll probably post it. Um, but I can show you some other examples of that use of that, um, that perspectival box right here is a piece where it was done very, very fast using a very limited, I think I have a picture of the color key that I did for that one. You can all see that um, four color, it's actually three colors and charcoal, um, and how it's just something that is a study of light figure is a point of departure to create a design in a shape building. You know, it's very much like what I'm doing there. And these pastels are something that really lead me into an oil painting. Um, Martin, when you're so, looking at um, when you're looking at the whole composition and determining how the shapes, the positive and the negative shapes are laid out. Uh, what are you seeking? What kind of harmony or balance? Can you describe a little bit um, of how, I'm, how you plan the, <clears throat> the space? The, the, a lot of the space is based on usually the, the model. I tend to like to have, uh, like to work with models who do a lot of geometric uh, poses. Um, like this pose here um, was based on, uh, I can find it, a very triangular type of pose um, that a friend of mine who I work with, she's actually um, from Spain, and I do work with models that are from other countries actually. So that's the actual pose that she, that Maria did. And the way that I'm building that is basically through the geometry that's happening through uh, the pose. A very simple triangle uh, composition with a horizon line. And then I put the perspectival box around it. When you have a model that can do poses that are very uh, geometrically oriented. It makes it very, very, very simple to use your memory with a very limited color scheme to create a uh, kind of situation like that. So uh, I don't know if that answered your question, Viva. <laughs> I think yeah, it's no, based, that that it's definitely helps. You're looking at the model, but yeah, but the there model seems to be other things that are going on, the, the sense of balance or harmony that's happening yeah. in terms of placement. Exactly. And that really does depend on the model, A, knowing what they're doing, B, having a very strong sense of space around them. I find that models that are dancers or who have been posing for quite an amount, a good amount of time really know how space is around them. And those are the easiest and much more uh, enjoyable pieces, paintings, to, uh, models to work from. So um, does that make any sense to you all? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I tend to um, not like to work on pieces too long. I have uh, a very short attention span when it comes to a piece of you 
because uh, I a just don't want to become obsessive with um, a piece that I'm doing. I like to let it breathe a lot. So I'm looking for um, here's another quick oil that I did um, from a pose that was very much kind of what we did, what I did for you all, based on a very limited palette range. Okay, and then she got into this triangle pose with the horizon going on there. Okay, so when you have that situation happening, it's just pretty much water off a, oops, water off a duck's back to do that. So, um, anybody have any questions about that? Yes, no, maybe so. Um, I have a question. Why do you prefer working from memory and abstracting the figure versus working from life and working representationally? Because you're really working between figuration and abstraction, kind of at that intersection. Um, mm -hmm. But how, co how come you chose to go this way? What, what about it excites you? Well, there you go. <laughs> That sounds pretty good. I like that. Well, is that I actually, our answer? <laughs> yeah, that's your answer. I love that answer. Well, I, Vida, I started out very academically. You know, I have some images that I can show of um, some of my pieces. Um, like here's something that is very representational but with a little bit of that abstraction. Uh, but I started out very, very closed formed and academic. And I think for me, what um, uh, was always bothering me was looking at how Dada or Sheila or Michelangelo, how they would create something simple. And a lot of the thing that kept coming back to me was memory, the whole idea of memory, how you, how much more powerful, what you can, you can do something much more powerful if you put something down that you remember from that moment. Uh, so I find it uh, very difficult and I find it challenging. And I think that uh, is why we paint, because it's challenging and it's because it's a little bit unattainable. It makes you kind of stretch your abilities in a way that uh, you don't usually do and you become very surprised by your results. I'm constantly being surprised by when I use my recollection, how much I've attained over time. So uh, I don't know if that's a good answer. Um, but another thing that I would also let you all know as I demo here another piece do several is that I love destruction if I have something such as this you know it doesn't take me it's no skin off my nose to just get rid of it okay this is one of these things that I love to teach in my class is to just obliterate what you do and then build on top of it okay the whole idea of letting go of something uh, releases you from loving something and makes you go forward and makes you become um, someone who is willing to um, risk. And painting and drawing is all about risk. It's all about taking uh, the initiative to see what's, you know, beyond the hillside. Okay. I'm actually working from a photo reference here. Um, that was my next question. Are, are you always working from a reference point? Um, or I start out, I start out from a reference and then I try to, to wean myself from it. So the reference is always the beginning. And then there comes a conscious moment where I have to tell myself, get away from it. 
okay? Move away from it and then see how far you can go from that initial um, spark. You know, when I see a model doing a pose and the way that they create spaces around uh, the environment they're in, it's very exciting to see shapes like that and how your form reacts to it. And so I go away from the model and I try to work off of the energy of that excitement as much as possible. At some point, you will begin to get bored. That's when you go back to your photo reference and get a little bit more uh, enthusiasm. You, I try to use um, kind of milk as much enthusiasm off of my initial response without being um, determined by the photo reference. But it does start out with, I think you have to have some form of, of being influenced by a reference that's in reality. But you should push yourself to get away from it as quick as you can and work from uh, your recollection. Does that it's, make sense? Yeah, totally. It seems that in the abstraction process happens when you look at the reference and then you break it down into very simple geometric shapes. Is, is that correct? Yes, very much so. And you have to keep the energy of those shapes. There's a lot of energy happening in a shape like that. You know, it's a very, very energetic uh, way of getting yourself into a problem. Um, and so, you know, I kind of work off of the energy of that intensity of geometry, you know. But it only will feed you so much. You have to look at the photo reference after a while. So uh, a good and expensive paint to use, I'd say Gamblin is a very good brand of paint that is inexpensive and has very good tinting quality. I mean, if you really want to get good paint, go to Old Holland, but that's going to make you uh, go poor very quickly. Um, but I love Gamblin. It's probably the brand I love to use. Uh, but that's exciting. You know, this, I don't know why I even covered that. The intensity of that is very, very thrilling to me. It gets me away from the figure and makes me think of uh, this abstraction. And when you move away from this pastel, it just keeps, has that power, it keeps going. Uh, there's a good combination of, combination of things that are making it happen. It's these sharp geometric shapes and then it's the arbitrary color working together as a team um, to create tension that brings a viewer into the piece. Um, this is something that I look at when I look at master paintings, particularly um, um, the one artist that comes to mind is, um, is um, Vermeer. You know, Vermeer is very, very influential to me in terms of how he was able to create an amazing design. You can go to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. and go look at the woman with the red hat. It's a very small painting. It's actually much smaller than this painting here. It's, I think it's this big, the actual painting. But when you go into that room, every painting disappears. It just drags you in. Part of that may be because of the popularity of the painting, but I really think a lot of it is just his design. He was able to use geometry and use very arbitrary color, really, uh, to blend and bring, your, bring the viewer in. Now this um, pastel little demo that I did is a reference from, and I hope I have it here, I think I do. Yeah, here it is. This is the photo that I did from that. Okay. And there's a lot of beautiful things happening in this pose that I can just fall in love with. You know, there's like 
the lower the lower vertebrae. You can see her scapula, the beautiful ears, you know, the bricks in the wall, all these beautiful tones in her skin. Um, but I am compelled to look for use my toolbar. I'm still learning how to use this toolbar right. You know, this kind of big shape here. Boom, boom, boom. You know, and that helps me produce something like that. Now this leg is all wonky. It just doesn't work. But I think it works because it's wonky. You know, I'm thinking of how uh, you know, you look at Degas, who is one of, another one of my big influences. Any number of his paintings um, are very, very just completely wonky. You know, this arm here, use my toolbar here, it's just way too long if you were to imagine how it attaches to her torso. It's just incredibly too long. There's no way the human body does that. A lot of the anatomy in the back is very incorrect. Um, his foreshortening in this leg is just, it's really, really disturbing, but it works as a composition. Definitely a situation that I've learned through my work, how you have to sacrifice um, what you see for the greater cause of the painting. And Degas, if you put him against the wall, you know, he could do this. He knew how to draw that. He knew what to do here. He knew what to do there. You know, he just didn't think that was important. What was important was creating the design. Okay, so he had to sacrifice what he did for the, what he knew about the form to create the big idea. And that's basically what I'm always thinking about doing when I'm creating the work. I know that I can draw that figure, but I'm moving away from it and seeing how it um, creates a composition, okay? And this whole idea of destruction, you know, well, I do a lot of demos on Instagram. I'll do like a four, I, like at least three times, three or four times a week I do lives on Instagram. And when I do this, I get a, I see people exclaiming on Instagram, why did you do that? You just destroyed something beautiful. And I have to explain to them that just let it go. You let it go. The more that you, and it sounds kind of counterproductive, but the more that you let go, the more you internalize and remember. I feel that the more that I've destroyed, uh, the more I've been able to actually keep, you know. So when I'm doing a piece, I'm constantly thinking about how am I going to affect these four sides? How is this figure going to pierce each side of that, of that canvas, the paper, the panel? Um, I know this is an oil painting demo, but um, I think this is, you can kind of see how this would translate in oil in a very limited palette range. So. Martin, what's your Instagram? So we can all follow your live demos. Okay, it's Compos Martin 030. I'll be doing one early tomorrow morning at seven o'clock because I had someone from Russia who uh, wanted me to do one. Because she gets up I mean, that's kind of late for people in Russia. So yeah, that is Compos Martin 030. My, um, when you go to Instagram, my uh, face, <laughs> my little uh, avatar, I guess that's what you call it, mm -hmm. is this uh, Rembrandt painting. Okay. So that. So you'll see mm -hmm. that in a circle. Mm -hmm which I feel is one of the world's greatest figurative paintings. That's just me. <laughs> that Rembrandt painting is such a delight. So um, you can imagine this is an oil and uh, the way that uh, I'm doing this in pastel is how exactly how I would do it in oil. Um, 
and I'm not neat. This is my pastel setup. <laughs> okay. It's purposely a mess. Uh, if I had all my reds and all my blues and all my yellows and all my whites perfectly aligned, I would be too hesitant to mess up my arrangement. Here, I just grab a color. You know, it's very, very, I want to keep it as much a mystery as I possibly can. So I like to think very quickly, uh, contrast. Well, it seems like um, chance and accident play a, uh, some part in oh, yeah. how you very, make very, your work. Yeah, that's where I get some of my best ideas. Uh, I'm, I can show you all a painting I'm working on. A, uh, this is a four by four foot. Let me turn my lights on. It's gonna be getting dark in the studio. Uh, but this is a four by four foot painting that you can really see the struggle. It's a huge mess, but I see a form in there. Okay. Yeah. And this paint, yeah, you know, this painting will will evolve eventually into uh, a form. So there's a lot of of just mark making. You know, it's just me. Sometimes it's like, oh, I want to see what green looks like on my panel, and I literally put, put green on uh, my surface and then I'll just sit with it. This right here was a mark that I just made. And it actually looks like a face looking sideways. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of chance happening when I'm doing these. It's very much like jazz, you know, it's like call response. Um, I have another piece that I finished and that is all about the face. Mm -hmm. That's that, beautiful. That was, this was going all over the place for quite a while. And then I locked in on a, on a face and it pretty much shut the whole painting down. It made the whole thing slow down. There was a reason for all of this to exist once I put the face down. And it, and it really, really worked. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going through my yellow phase these days. I'll show you one last one. This is my studio here in Germanville. Are you at the firehouse building? Yes. Oh yeah, it looks familiar. So, so this is another four by four foot piece. And the thing that got me into it was the nose. Yeah. Well, the nose seems art. kind of like the most um, representational part of the painting, too. I think it really stands out. The painting is just, is just my making, but that's my key. This is the key part, and everything else is doing a bit service to it. Uh, I'm a big... Um, Willem de Kooning fan, and mm -hmm. he had uh, this method when he would do his figurative pieces where he would actually cut out a mouth from a newspaper and stick it on his painting. And he said that was a way that he was able to have a, um, a stamp. He had that one little thing, and the rest of the painting was going crazy figuratively, but he had this literal mouth on his painting and it was from a new from a magazine clipping and it was a, he was able to kind of just nail the painting from there that was a one piece of reality that the rest of the painting had to uh, revolve around and the rest of painting the pa the rest of the piece had to support hmm. and so when i'm doing a piece like this um there will be at some point one part of the piece that will have to carry the brunt of the composition. But you don't know what it is until you actually, you know, push it. You have to push a painting. Like her head was going to be here, but then I brought a straight line here. You know, I'm willing to destroy something 
and cut into something to create uh, drama, you know, and also uh, will it be willing to change something in midstream? You know, I love to use very, very arbitrary color to push form. And uh, it was something that when I was a student at the academy, they didn't like. <laughs> they didn't like the fact that I used bright color. It's a very tonal school. They were very tonal there. And I would use purples and greens and oranges and pinks. And <laughs> you're, not, you're, not, you're not doing the right thing. You know, you need to stick with tonality. And it's like, it was a constant battle. And I've always stuck to it. You know, I feel that if you have really bright color out of a tube, just use it. You know, the more that I salivate when I paint, the better I know that I'm doing my job. Uh, I actually kind of like this little pastel. This could easily be a painting that I can yeah. translate. And um, I've only looked at the photo reference maybe once or twice. And again, what makes it easy is this kind of triangle type of thing happening. I'm breaking this down into geometries. Okay, mm -hmm. that plus, you know, knowledge of anatomy, doing it over and over and over and over again for years and years and years. Speaking you know, of anatomy, um, does proportion play a part in abstracting the figure and how you it, abstract the figure? It does, but it doesn't, it's not an empirical part. It's just a little character in the big scheme of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't let it, the rules, I know those rules and I've, I, I can break them now. Uh, but they do creep in and stop. I don't want the flow to stop, right? The minute that I begin to think, well, this is too long and it doesn't, then I'm, I'm stopping the flow. So you, it's there, but I don't let it come into the party and ruin it. <laughs> but I stick to them. You know, I know when a drawing's bad. I know when it needs to be uh, adjusted. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, let's do another one. I love destroying. I would them. love to do another one, but we're almost out of time. We have about <laughs> three minutes left. Can you do one in three minutes? Yeah. Okay. These are so simple. I mean, these are, this is like oil painting. You know, this is much... I thought I would do these pastels, which are, it's a painting, pastel painting. <clears throat> well, these are a bit more immediate for you guys than I think my oil paintings. But you know, working big, this, you know, you can do big pieces, you know, quick pieces, because the model can really pose, you know, she or he. I also draw men. I don't don't only draw women. Um, when they get into these very simple geometric poses, you know, they become very fun to do. I'm cheating a little bit because I am using a photo reference, but I'm trying to keep it very simple. Let's try this kind of red here. It's not going to work because it's go back to that green. So negative space is very important to frame your form. And let's see. Now you can t tell my paper's beginning to get a little like can't work with me anymore, Martin. I'm filling you up. You're, 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 you're beating the heck out of me too much. I can't take anymore. It'll, your paper will end up doing that. It'll be, it'll only take so much. Um, like up here, it's a little rough. There's a lot of pastel that's filled that space in a little bit. Let's do her head as the shape. And connect it to the bottom. So at this point, I'm kind of not really looking at the reference, and I'm just having fun with negative space. Like, what can I get away with without it not becoming a figure anymore, you know? 
I do apply fixative. I use uh, this stuff, Sennelier. Fixative. Very good stuff. So at what point do you do it? When do you feel like a drawing is so good that you're not going to destroy it? Usually after the 15th drawing. Okay. I'll have a model come into my studio and I'll just start out with, you know, gestures like this to do things like that. A lot of these things. So she'll get into poses like that and the next pose will be something like this. Um, and I'll do, you know, tons and tons of those. And the more of those that I do, the more I get to know the model, the more my confidence is built. And then I begin to kind of save the drawings. Um, so that's kind of it. It all depends on what the model brings to me, what she brings or he brings to the studio. I'm really keying in on their emotion. So um, I once worked with a model before who uh, I went to draw, she came to pose for me and she just broke down crying. Her body completely changed. It just, um, her body just puffed up. And turns out that she broke up with her boyfriend that morning. And I said, you know, do you want me to leave? You, you can go. It's like, no, I need you to be here to draw me while I'm going through this. And it was an incredible experience. You know, I was deal she gave me this wonderful opportunity to draw her while she was going through this uh, emotion, emotional period in her life. And my drawings were unreal. You know, they were very unreal. She, I was just literally in her, I was taking a ride with her through her emotion. And so a lot of that will determine sometimes if I stop a drawing or not. So I, I really do leave it in the hands of, of the model when I'm drawing them to let me know when to stop it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, so that, yeah that's the, an uh, intense story. Yeah, the fixative that I use, it's uh, Sennelier. If you all can see that. Um, you can get it at Blick. This is the charcoal fixative, but you can get the pastel fixative. I find that uh, this is the most um, archival uh, fixative that you can use for pastel. Uh, but Wonderful. Conser conservators will tell you don't put any fixative on your pastel. Don't put any varnish on your paintings uh, because those will eventually break down the color. The way that I like to store my drawings is in museum boxes away from light and with glassine, which is a protective glass film. Uh, uh, it's like a protective wax paper, like paper in between drawings. And I don't move them, I keep them. Now, if someone wants to buy a drawing, that's when I'll fix it and ship it. So that's kind of the answer to that. Awesome. Martin, this was so much fun. So yeah, meditative. So beautiful. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing your process with us. Of it's so special. Of course. It's an yeah. honor. You know, I yeah. wish that you can, you all could sit in my studio for five hours and watch me really do <laughs> painting. Because it's, it's, it's not easy. I have to destroy a lot. And I actually like the fact that I'm, 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 you know, those, when you were watching me do those little pastels and I was getting rid of them, it felt good to do that. You know, the more that you It's definitely a shock to watch it happen. I, I yeah. certainly flinch. I'm like, no, that was so beautiful. <laughs> but it's your process. It's what, yeah. you know, makes you make more and more beautiful work. So that's yeah, amazing. Again, yeah, it's when you let go of it, ah, you appreciate it more. Mm -hmm. You appreciate it more. And again, that for me has been the secret to whatever success I've ever done with the figure is to kind of let go. And the more I let go, the more I really know what to keep. If you awesome. all can kind of leave this webinar with one thing, I would say, uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Let your true feelings show. And if it's an accident, take advantage of it and get rid of it. Don't treat it preciously. The more you do that, the more you're going to accept. 
the goodness that happens in your work. Love be, it. You, be human when you're working with the human form. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> thank you so well, much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it was great to see so many familiar faces. Martin, thanks again. Uh, join us next week for more uh, Fleischer from a Distance webinars. You can find the schedule on our calendar page. Otherwise, everyone have a great night. Stay safe and see Thank you all you next all. week. Yes. Yeah. Be healthy. Be healthy. Keep those masks on. <laughs> thanks, Martin. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.